as I scroll down to the right spot on the outline so I can actually get to the first question. The first one comes from our good friend at PFTPM Posse, who is a Cowboys fan, and it's good that we have someone who knows the Cowboys very well on the program today. Can you give Cowboys fans a reason, just one if you can even get to one, to be optimistic <laughs> about the Cowboys for the coming season? Shireen, I will defer to you on this very important question of whether there's any reason to have hope for the Dallas Cowboys. Well, first, Mike, I'll start with PFT and Posse, who must be from Texas because it's y'all, not you, as you read. You misread. It is y'all. So I, I think he's from Texas, but we know he's a Cowboys fan, right? Um, I'll give you three, actually. They have the best quarterback in the division. I don't know if they have the best roster. I think the Eagles have the best roster, but I think the Cowboys have the best quarterback in the division, which always gives you a chance. Micah Parsons. I mean – Perhaps the best rookie season ever by a defensive player. Just outstanding uh, rookie season. Uh, finished in the top three in, in defensive player of the year voting. And he's already established himself as one of the best defensive players in football. I think that's a positive. And then getting Dane Quinn back as your defensive coordinator because he made such a big difference with that defense last year. He's going to continue to do that this year. So those are the three reasons, I think, for optimism. Again, when I look at the NFC East, I still think the Eagles have the best roster, but the Cowboys have the best quarterback, so that's going to give them a chance to win that division. Yeah, look, I agree with you, too. And in year two for Micah Parsons, he could be dramatically better. Year two of Dan Quinn running the defense presumably will be better. And it's not like they were the 85 Bears last year. It was very good in comparison to what a crap show it was the year before under Mike Nolan. Their defense still statistically was not good last year, but it was much better than it had been. And with Micah Parsons developing in one of the best young talents in the NFL, if not one of the best defensive players, depending upon his trajectory in year two, that is cause for optimism. So I'm with you, but I also agree with you that the Eagles have the better roster currently, and the Eagles have done more to try to improve the team this year than the Cowboys have. And 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 I know the Cowboys are handcuffed by the salary cap, but you see what the Rams do. You see every year the Saints exactly. who are in cap hell. Mickey Loomis starts waving his cap wand around, and the next thing you know, everything's fine again. I I I don't know why the Cowboys weren't able to to solve whatever cap issues were supposedly keeping them from doing whatever they needed to do. And I wonder, Shereen, in hindsight, when you look at what's happened with the receiver market, do you think they regret not keeping Amari Cooper and paying him $20 million? I, I think they will once the season begins because now that looks like something of a bargain based on what's happened this offseason. But the fact that they didn't get enough for him when you look at some of the trades because – I got a fifth round draft pick for Amari Cooper. To me, that wasn't enough to get for. Now I realize they were they had a deadline they had to, to to meet to get that done, but some way you have to work that out where you can get more than a fifth round draft pick for Amari Cooper, or you keep him on your roster. And yeah, I, I think Cowboys fans expected the Cowboys and Jerry Jones to do what the Rams have done to figure out to pay all these guys, and you got to have cash on hand to do that. Jerry Jones has cash on hand, but as I've said for a long time, people think Jerry Jones spends a lot of money. Jerry Jones spends a lot of money on things that he really wants to spend money on, yachts, helicopters, those sorts of things. When Jerry Jones doesn't want to spend money, he doesn't spend money. And this is a team that hasn't spent big money on players outside of their own organization, players that they drafted since Brandon Carr, and I can't imagine that Brandon Carr has scared, scarred them that much in his $50 million deal that he didn't live up to, that they just never go out in free agency and sign that big draft pick, but they haven't since Brandon Carr. Yeah, I mean, go look it up, the biggest free agent they've signed since Brandon Carr. There, haven't been, there hasn't been one. I mean, we don't talk about the Cowboys in free agency that first week of free agency because they don't sign anybody. It's amazing. But I've heard Jerry say time and again, and my Jerry Jones impersonation isn't nearly as good as it could be, but along the lines of, you would be very surprised at the size of the check I would write if it would guarantee me a Super Bowl. He created this impression that he'll spend, 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 spend. But you're right. 
You're right. It may just be all talk. It may be huckstering. It may be creating the impression that without a salary cap, he would go buy every player with a salary cap. And with a salary cap, it is very flexible and malleable and allows every other team to go out and buy expensive players. Why aren't they going out there and paying top dollar to these guys on the open market? And I'm not saying that that is the magic formula to winning a Super Bowl. Maybe they've just decided the best way to get there is the way the old school Cowboys did, pre-free agency, the Cowboys of yeah. our youth, who remember there was a time when the Cowboys and the Steelers were completely built of their own. Now, it's not like you had free agency, but still, guys moved around. Guys were cut. Guys were traded. The Cowboys and the Steelers were exclusively constructed of guys they had drafted and developed. And remember, running back Preston Pearson was the one exception at one point. He went from the Steelers to the Cowboys. Other than that, it was all homegrown talent. I, I just I feel like they've strategically decided that this is what we're going to do, that there's too much risk in giving big money to someone we don't know. Yeah, they had the dirty dozen, the 12 rookies who made the roster in 1975 and went to the Super Bowl and lost the Steelers in that Super Bowl. And they did build, of course, most teams did Why? back then. Why? But, no, but it was this is completely uncalled for. We're not talking about Drew Pearson pushing off Nate Wright today. <laughs> I didn't wander in the direction of it. It's his I, birthday this is week. Bull crap. Wow. All right. Go ahead. Wow, it's his birthday week. But, yeah, my, I do think that's what they've decided is we draft very, very well, and they have. It's hard to argue that they haven't drafted well for the most part. Second-round picks, maybe not so much. But they have drafted pretty darn well, and, and I think they've just decided that that's the route they're going to go and take care when it comes time to write those checks that Jerry talks about, that they're going to write those checks to their own players and keep their own players. Of course, it didn't work out so well with Randy Gregory. I mean, he went to the Broncos. So, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, but I do think you've got to supplement in this day and age. I do think you have to supplement your roster with some free agents who can help you or with some trades that can help you. And I just don't know that they've done that this off season. James Washington, Dante Fowler, they just don't do much for me. Uh, and based on what their roster was last season to this season, I don't think it looks better. I think it looks worse. Maybe not dramatically worse, but I do think they're worse than they ended the season last year. And look, they need to hold some cap money back because they're going to be back at the table with Dak Prescott before they know it. That contract they did, four years, $160 million, a, a glorified Band-Aid deal, and they're going to have to get him re-signed to a market-level deal sooner rather than later or move on from him, which I don't think they want to do. Neil Watches PFT asks, which Patriots offshoot has a better record in 2022, the Patriots, the Raiders, or the Texans, and obviously Josh McDaniels, now the coach of the Raiders, and Dave Ziegler, former Patriots executive, now the GM. Josh McDaniels there, and why am I blanking on Nick Casario's name? I'm not now. It came to me, Nick Casario and also Jack Easterby in Houston. Which of those three teams has the best record? I think we can cross the Texans off. I think it comes down to the Patriots yeah, or the absolutely. Raiders, Shereen. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Raiders, Mike. And despite them playing in the hardest division in football, I just think they're the, the best team of those three. Have the veteran quarterback, now have Devontae Adams. I think it's going to be the Raiders or the Patriots, and I, I think the Raiders end up with the better record. I, I want to say the Patriots, but, boy, what an experiment this year to all of a sudden have Bill Belichick heavily involved in the offense and Matt Patricia, longtime defensive coordinator, potentially – in the Chris Sims leader house to call plays offensively for the Patriots this year. Their division isn't easy either. I'll agree with you that I think the Raiders will have the better record and the best record of those three teams. MK Rodick, which team is getting overhyped right now? There's always one every year that completely falls flat. Shereen, do you have one that you think is maybe getting a little too well, much hype? Yeah, and I saw this question in here before we started, and I started running through my mind, who is it? Because he's right. There's always one who, who is overhyped. The fact is, the four teams that we keep talking about in the AFC West, they're all really good. The chances of all four of those teams making the postseason are really not very good. So... I think I'm going to go, it's either the Broncos or the Chargers for me. And the Chargers, again, they haven't gotten it done for as much as we, we hype Justin Herbert. He hasn't gotten to the postseason yet. And Joe Burrow, obviously, 
did, got his team to the Super Bowl. So I think there's a lot of pressure on Justin Herbert this year. But I think I'm going to go with the Broncos, that, that they're going to be the team that's over height that doesn't get it done. Because when you look at their roster and what they have, you would think they're going to contend for the division title. And I'm going to say they're not going to win that division and maybe not even make the postseason. And, you know, the Broncos were the team I thought of, too, when I went through in my mind the grid of the 32 teams in the two conferences and the eight divisions because of the difficulty degree of the AFC West. And they're the one team in the division with a new head coach. You got a lot of new there. You got a new head coach and a new – well, Josh McDaniels, too. But you got a new coach and a new quarterback. So I I think that those two combined create a real challenge. The the level of the competition – um. And just the fact that, you know, yeah, they're going to have an owner and that's going to give them a little bit of a boost, but it's not like Rob Walton and Greg Penner are going to come in right away and and make the kind of changes that will dramatically improve the team. I think it's good for the Broncos over the long haul to have an owner again instead of a trust that runs the team. But I look, as much as I am a Russell Wilson fan, I think he has dipped a little bit in recent years, or maybe it's that others have passed him by. I don't think he has the mobility that he used to have. And I think to the extent that he thinks he's going to show up in Patrick Mahomes' division and match Patrick Mahomes blow for blow, throw for throw, run for run, I'll believe it when I see it. I just, you know, this whole thing about Russell Wilson wanting the offense to run through him and the Seahawks would never do it, it's going to be a great experiment as to whether or not it works with Russell Wilson as the centerpiece of the offense. But I just think there's too much other competition in the division for the Broncos. And look at all the standalone games they have this year. They've gotten the most hype based upon the schedule makers. They believe in the Broncos. They got a ton of primetime and standalone games. They're going to have to deliver, and I think we may be expecting a little bit too much for the Broncos. Not that they're going to be horrible, but I don't think they're going to be as great as as so many people think. Over-under wins for Miami. This comes from Antonelli Dean. The current over-under is 8.5. Are you above or are you below the points bet projected total of 8.5? I'm over, Mike. I'm going nine. I think that the Dolphins are going to be right there in the division, uh, right behind the Bills, and I think they're going to make the post. I think they'll be that team outside uh, of the North to uh, of the West to make the postseason. Um, and I do think they'll come out of that division. But it all goes back to Tua. We just talked about. I mean, it, it, if Tua plays like he's played over the last two years, they're they're not going to get there. They're they're not. But they, you know. Brian, when you look at Brian Flores and what he did the last two years, he got them the wins. He didn't get them in the postseason. So maybe they have to win one more than that. Maybe they have to get to 10 or 11 uh, to get into the postseason. But they've certainly got an easier schedule, I think, than those teams in the West have. Um, I agree with you. I think that they will be over. And the question is, will they – win more than eight and a half games because of Tua or in spite of Tua? In spite. That's really going to be the question. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, if the Dolphins make the playoffs, does that guarantee Tua 2023? Or will the question be, how much better could we have been if we had somebody else at quarterback? And the Dolphins are going to be, I believe, the most attractive team in 2023 for a veteran quarterback looking for a new home. Whether it's Tom Brady or Lamar Jackson or anyone else that has a wandering eye after this season, two is going to have to show that he's a reason why the team is good, that they're good because of him, not in spite of him. But I think they will be good. I'm all in with Mike McDaniel. So I I definitely think that that is uh, a low eight and a half. I go higher. And I think the the Dolphins will not only be on the right side of 500 this year, but also in the playoffs. All right, a couple of questions we're going to combine together. Basically, and let's focus more on the Stephen Ross investigation. I'll focus on the Dr. J144 question here. Neil Watches PFT had a, had a similar inquiry. Why is the investigation regarding Stephen Ross taking so long? He either said it or he didn't, and there's a witness unless there isn't. Um, let, let me try this one first, because I wrote about this recently. Yeah. Roger Goodell was asked about Stephen Ross a couple of weeks ago at his press conference following the quarterly meetings. No update. Mary Jo White is investigating. And it really shouldn't take that much time. And I'm told that Brian Flores fully cooperated in April, even though he's got the pending litigation, fully cooperated with the investigation into whether or not Stephen Ross offered Flores $100,000 per loss in 2019 in order to have a sufficiently bad record so they'd get 
Joe Burrow with the first overall pick in 2020. And this should be fairly easy, right? What does Flores say? What are his allegations? When was it said? How was it said? Who was present? You talk to the witnesses. It was NFL Network owned by the league, partially owned by the Dolphins. Cameron Wolf reported there is a person who witnessed what Stephen Ross said, unnamed witness. Well, they should be able to figure out who it is. You ask Flores, and you try to figure it all out, and then you ask Ross. It shouldn't take that much time. Shereen, I think what's going to happen is they're going to find that he was joking when he said it, that the offer was not made seriously. It was not made in jest. It wasn't reduced to writing. They're going to come up with some cockamamie excuse for letting Stephen Ross off the hook because if you fry Stephen Ross for this, you create all sorts of other problems for the league. You're exposing the world to the idea that you have corruption in your ranks at a time when Congress is already aggressively pursuing the Washington commander's investigation and the cover-up of the aftermath of that. And you're opening yourself up to civil liability, a class action lawsuit from anyone who bet on the Dolphins in 2019. If you come out and say, he did this, he committed an affront to the integrity of the game by offering his coach $100,000 per loss, by wanting to lose games, by wanting to throw games. And you also open the door for a prosecutor to come in and start charging people under the Sports Bribery Act. So I think Mary Jo White, who is very good at giving the NFL what they want, or she wouldn't keep getting these assignments, is going to give the NFL what it wants. And that is some sort of a path through the weeds to get to the point where the end result is Stephen Ross did nothing wrong. Okay, and Mike, there's there's another part of this too, the Brian Flores lawsuit. So how does that play into the Brian Flores lawsuits? In other words, if they come out and say, yes, absolutely, he talked about tanking, we have a witness, doesn't that then Brian Flores is, you know, that plays into the lawsuit, right? Absolutely. They're not going to want to help Brian Flores make his case right. against the Dolphins. That's an excellent point. However, however... To the extent that the Brian Flores lawsuit is also an effort to expose and redress systemic racism in the NFL, if there's a way you can say, hey, look, it had nothing to do with race. It was all about this $100,000 offer that he refused to accept that that's what caused him to fall out of favor. That actually helps the league in a roundabout way. But generally speaking, they're not going to want to find anything that would make it easier for Flores to win his case. So between the Flores case, the possibility of a class action brought by anyone who placed a legal wager on the Dolphins and possibly setting Stephen Ross up for a perp walk and having Congress open a new front in this war against the NFL, they gain nothing, nothing by finding that Stephen Ross in some way was trying to throw games at the cost of $100,000 each. Last question, very important. How did this make it on here? Stan Germ, is Florio the smartest hillbilly to ever come out of West Virginia? I am saying yes. Uh, I, uh, Matt Casey calls it a compliment. No, it's, a, it's an insult to all of my, my fellow West Virginians. People think that we're a bunch of inbred hillbilly rednecks and – if you came here and if you lived here, you would realize that's not the case. But I don't want more people coming here and living here. I like it the way it is. Stay out. Go ahead and think of us what you will if it means you stay out. Shireen, that's my official position. Although you're welcome favorite here anytime. West Virginians. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I have two favorite West Virginians, Mike Florio and Jimbo Fisher. So I am on team Jim Jimbo Fisher, too. He's from West Virginia. Yeah. But not Nick Saban. Not Nick Saban, though. Not an excitement. <laughs> they are literally from towns that are 20 miles apart. And Rich Rodriguez is from this neck of the woods, too. It really is amazing yeah. to think there was a time not that long ago where three of the best college football coaches were from, yeah. like, this little Bermuda Triangle in West Virginia. All right, let's take a break. Uh, the aftermath of the unfortunate comments made earlier this week by Jack Del Rio. We'll discuss that when this Friday edition of PFT Live continues right after this. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.